ahead and begin the webinar. My name is Dan. Um, I am going to be walking you through the demonstration this evening. Um, I should I should mention that I was the webinar trainer for Nick Software from 2009 to 2014, um, doing all sorts of other jobs as well while I was there. Um, but I'm going to be talking about the use of control points this evening uh, for about the next 45 minutes or so, and um, we're going to be using them within PhotoLab and within the Nick plugins. So, um, out of curiosity, ladies and gentlemen, oh, not getting any video at this time. Oh, by the way, if if my voice freezes, if you can't hear me or it cuts out during the webinar, give it a few seconds, but um, log out and log back in if it freezes for a bit or um, if there's uh, any kind of problem like that, because what can happen is that the um, signal will drop out or can drop out. Let me just answer Herb right now. He's it's not getting any video feed. Uh, log, oh, yeah, log out and log back in. Herb, you can hear me. You just can't see uh, the screen. Okay, that should fix that. Zoom is a much better platform. Arnie, are you referring to, I'm not sure what you mean. I'm not, I'm not familiar with Zoom. Okay, perfect. So, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to be discussing control points and sculpting light and utilizing them for um, adjustments, basically, utilizing U-point technology control points from the Nick collection, as well as uh, DxO Photo Lab this evening. And um, I, I want to just premise this by saying that a control point is a fantastic, almost magical tool for making selections and then selective adjustments in a way that looks photographic. Uh, there are all sorts of other kinds of selective tools out there. They all have a time and place, but there's, there's, it never hurts to have another tool in your tool belt, especially if it's not heavy to carry around, right? Uh, and these control points sure aren't heavy. Once, once you get used to them, once you understand how they're making their selections and therefore um, what you could hypothetically do with them. So um, we're going to start out within Photo Lab here. I want to show you the localized adjustments and the controls that you can do uh, here in Photo Lab 2 because you have uh, to the nth control over control and light uh, using control points. Now, uh, this capture is straight out of camera, and um, I, I mention that because I would go in and make adjustments within essential tools going into light. Uh, maybe we'll warm this image up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to focus on the use of control points for the demonstration, but note that I would probably move in here and, and utilize a lot of these tools on most images. Maybe not at their defaults, but you know I love what the DxO Clearview does, at least for the most part, on images like this, on nature images especially. Uh, and we can actually utilize this algorithm selectively using control points. So that can be really interesting and wonderful and beautiful. And by the way, if you have any questions, feel free to type them into the questions box. I'll periodically refer to the GoToWebinar control panel as we switch from image to image. Um, and if there are any audio problems, again, um, like, I guess, log out and log back in. Um, okay, got it. And we've got a bunch of comments, but no direct questions at this point. Okay. So, we're in Photo Lab. I want to make a localized adjustments. Uh, the tools on the right side here, these are all global adjustments. Uh, when I'm ready to use control points or a gradient tool or a brush tool within Photo Lab 2, you click the local adjustments tool. And this is going to allow us to basically just drop what I call adjustment control points on an object or on an area um, for you to dodge and burn or adjust color or contrast or sharpness even, and in fact, even blur um, using one of the controls within control points. Now, we are going to be describing and talking about how these control points work in each of the pieces of software um, or if they are different. And the, the control points that are in Photo Lab 2 are pretty different than the control points that are within uh, the Nick collection, but they, they function with the same concept, meaning you place the point on the object that you want to adjust. The control point is going to uh, make a selection for you of the object or area that you've placed the point on. And then what you're able to do is basically make all these kinds of adjustments, exposure, contrast, micro contrast, clear view, so on and so forth. And I'll describe all of these, but um, the other thing that you might note is that there's a circle going around the control point. It's not making a circular selection. It's actually making a selection inside of the circle of the object that you drop the point on. 
So uh, we place the point on this tree here, and then we can go into something like exposure um, or contrast and or any of these adjustments. And again, the idea here is that I'm able to selectively make these adjustments. I have a cat yelling at me. Uh, there's a, the cat, my wife's cat Jeep is just staring at me and meowing. He probably wonders why I'm talking to my computer. So um, I, if it gets annoying, let me know. I'll, I can put him into the bedroom and lock him in. Um, okay, so we've placed our point. I'm adjusting the exposure. And what you'll notice is that the adjustment, as long as I'm somewhat careful, is gonna make a pretty photographic looking control and adjustment, right? As I bring my exposure slider up to plus 2.57, that's way too far for this tree uh, to, to be able to dodge that area, to brighten uh, those leaves up. But the thing that I want you to note, and I'm gonna to continue to do this, is I'm gonna make really strong adjustments on the image so you can get an idea of where the selection is being made. And then I'm gonna to start to pull back the adjustment and kind of let it render and take a look. So um, I've brightened up the tree. Let's go like three quarters of a stop, 0.78. And then I'm gonna add a little bit of contrast and we're gonna add a little bit of clear view. And in, in Photo Lab 2, we've got the um, light adjustments, the color adjustments, and then the detail adjustments. So if in this case, I wanted to go in and adjust vibrancy or I can custom control white balance selectively, which is a really incredible control, um, I'll go and warm that tree up just a little bit, and then we're going to get even more color contrast between the tree and the background, right? And in fact, let's talk about how these control points are making their masks or making their selections and then how the adjustment is being made. So if I click on my control point, uh, you can see all of the adjustment sliders. Um, if I go to the area of influence, the circle that's around the control point, I can size that. And actually, we're not making a circular selection but we are making a selection inside of the circle. And to get a good feel for that, if you move down to the bottom here and click show masks, you're gonna be able to see um, what is being affected and what is not being affected by this control point. Anything that has a, a really dark shadow shade to it, we're not affecting. So you can actually see some of the image behind uh, the control point. We're not actually affecting much of any of this. What we are affecting is all of the stuff that's really light here. As I change the positioning of the control point, the point will actually instantly um, make a new selection for us. And this gives you a good idea of how the control point's making its selection. If I drop it up here, you can see it's going in and affecting the, the background a little bit, but it's primarily going to be selecting out uh, the tree itself. So it's a, a really incredibly powerful tool. Now, mind you, this webinar is of course for um, all sort of levels of NIC software and control point users. I want to explain um, the minutia of this, and then I want to make sure to give some tricks and tips for folks who maybe are uh, more experienced with these control points, and then talk about using these control points to enhance images a lot more than maybe we could do select or globally. So I drop a control point on the object. I'm going to basically place the point on the area that I think I want to affect, and then if there are any areas I don't want this control point to affect, and it is affecting that area, you move down into the control point section here, take a minus control point, place the point on the object or the area you don't want it to affect, and now that minus control point is gonna remove the effect off of that object or area. Now, the thing to think about with these control points is that you're going to make a, you're going to get and you're going to be making a very sort of photographic looking selection. So it's a very different looking selection and a very different kind of adjustment um, than let's say using a lasso tool or even a, an edge detection brush. It, the effect of it, you know, the, the overall concept is you're making a selection and then affecting the area, but uh, the control point's gonna make a very different looking selection and therefore you have a different kind of control. So, I've gone in with that first control point and I've lightened up our tree here. Uh, what I wanna do next is kind of create some separation between the foreground and the background. And we can do that using these control points. And I'm gonna do that by adding a new mask. So I click new mask here. I wanna make sure that my cursor is clicked onto the control point. And then I'll go place my point on the object that I wanna adjust. So I'll just place the control point on the, uh, the cliff face there in Yosemite. And then maybe I'll desaturate and remove some vibrancy. 
And um, we could even cool, do like a custom white balance adjustment to that background. And what we're go going to get from this is that we've got the uh, plus control point on the tree that's basically dodging and lightning. And then we also warmed it up. And then we placed the control point on the background. We cooled it down. Uh, we'll darken it just a little bit, very minimally. Uh, we could reduce or maybe add contrast depending upon what we're going for, depending upon what kind of look that we want. And um, it's gonna help to make that background recede. Now, I've placed the point on this object. We can, of course, click on it and drag it around until we like exactly what we're getting. And then the kind of next step with these uh, control points that are within PhotoLab is that if I wanted to make the exact same adjustment to this area back here, I don't need to make a new mask and control it in using those sliders. All I have to do is while this control point is active is place another point back there in the background. And then this control point is kind of like working in a group. It is a duplicate control point to this first control point. And so anything that we do to this first control point is gonna be reflected in that control, the second control point back there. And you can add as many of those as you want. We can go and throw one back here in these trees, maybe size the area to be a bit smaller. But now we're starting to get this nice kind of dynamic between the tree and the foreground and the background. Right, and, and so if we look at the before and after here, and we're, we're not done with these control points, and I could probably just use this image for the entire hour, but I wanna continue forward. Um, here's the before, and then there's the after. And I'm constantly using the compare button because now that I look at this, I think I've, I've lightened up the tree more than what I need to. And I'm also gonna just make sure that the tree or the control point that's on the tree is placed in the right place. So I'm gonna bring that back down. We'll maybe only um, dodge that area about 50% instead of, or sorry, uh, half a stop instead of a full stop. And then we can warm it up a little bit. So one complaint or, or one sort of visual distraction that I have within PhotoLab right now um, is the way that these control points are kind of active, right? Right now I can see my control point, but then I also see these minus control points um, and it can get a little bit distracting. So if you wanna see what your image looks like without those control points, you take your cursor and you just go over the side of the interface or the bottom of the interface, and then all of those control points disappear so that you can see your image uh, without those points. I do wanna make one more selection and adjustment here. Um, and I just wanna show you what the sharpening area does. So we went over lights, we went over color, we'll continue to talk about these things. Um, but in the detail section, we can use a sharpness algorithm to actually sharpen the foreground if we wanted to, or if we wanted to kind of enhance the fog effect that's there, I'm gonna go ahead and just reduce sharpness and then maybe even introduce some blur. Uh, if I go, if I take this blur slider to 100%, it blurs the heck out of that object a lot further than what I'm interested in in this case. But if I just take that blur up to maybe two or three, this very minimal effect, um, and then we can duplicate this control point and maybe place it over here in this corner, uh, we're gonna kind of create this interesting, subtle kind of faux depth of field. Now, of course, that, that doesn't mean that you should shoot everything that's you know, tack sharp from the foreground to the background, but oftentimes if we're trying to direct the viewer's attention through the image, uh, you, you can do this with a few techniques, right? You can dodge things because the lighter something is, typically the more likely the human eye is to be drawn to it. Uh, you can add saturation if you wanna direct the viewer's attention towards that area. Um, or you can, if you wanna direct the viewer's attention away from an area, you can reduce contrast, you can desaturate, you can blur or reduce detail. Right? And so being able to control these things selectively with these control points that make these photographic looking selection is really nice because all we got to do is point at the thing and then make the adjustment how we see fit. One more quick before and after. And this is, these are relatively subtle adjustments, but here's the before and there's the after. We could probably take it further, but it's already been 20 minutes. So I'm going to keep moving. Um, the next image that I'm going to demo with is uh, a photograph that was shot several years ago. Um, these are two friends of mine from uh, northeastern New York. So this is Lake Champlain, if anybody's familiar with um, that part of the world. And um, my, my, I convinced my friends to get dressed up the day after their wedding and to uh, go out to this sort of abandoned looking rock on the island of Valcor. 
and uh, we photographed at sunset. My, I had a pro photo strobe light and it wasn't working properly. Um, and so I, because we were losing light, I was like, whatever, we're just gonna shoot it and I'm gonna try to optimize it based upon whatever exposure I can get, right? And so this is right after the sun has set and we've got this nice sort of soft evening light. It's warm, but it doesn't sort of punch. It doesn't, there isn't a lot of uh, direction. There isn't a lot of texture. Um, there, it, it's the story is here, but I want some more pop to it. So again, I might move into my global adjustments and start adjusting those however we see fit. For the sake of the demonstration, I'm gonna go ahead and just use my local adjustments. It's already on. So as you can see, it's highlighted in the top portion of the interface here. So I'm just gonna click new mask, place a point back here in the cloud. And basically what we're gonna to wanna to do here, what I'm interested in doing is separating the foreground from the background and then getting some more punch out of the photograph. So to start with that, I'm gonna add a little bit of this clear view plus, it's gonna give us a little bit of texture, a little micro contrast, and then I'm gonna move into color and I'm gonna just purposely warm this color up maybe even add a little vibrancy once, once we've uh, once we've warmed it. Let's see how far we can take it without it looking weird. So maybe that's too far, but let's leave it there for now for demonstration purposes. I'm gonna go ahead and warm it with the magenta slider as well, or the tint slider. So we're getting some nice color back there in the background. And then we're gonna go ahead and just expand the area of influence out around the entire image. And so what the control point wants to do is go and find those similar tones and colors and textures, right? Uh, and so it wants to make that selection for us and then make whatever adjustment we've we've adjusted within the sliders. Uh, I am going to go into sharpness and let's see if we can get a little bit of sharpness out of this. Let's also take a look at the selection that we're getting um, because I think, again, my adjustment is very strong here, but I think what we're going to see as we click show masks is that we're getting a, the bulk of the effect there in the background you can see almost none of the effect is, uh, is adjusting in the rocks, and we're getting some of the effect on the dress. Now, the thing about this image specifically is that I actually want a lot of that adjustment to be reflected in the light part of the dress because it makes sense photographically and visually. But I do want to separate the foreground from the background. So what I'm definitely going to do is take minus control points and place them in the foreground here. and actually. Uh, note this as well, especially if you're a Nick software user um, and, and you've been using it a long time, as opposed to some folks who are out there who are, have been photo lab users and are visiting the webinar to learn more about the Nick collection. Um, and maybe you are as well. But basically, as I add new control points, um, the whatever the last size of my area of influence was is going to be the size of the area of influence of my new control point. Right, because I encompass the entire image basically with this first control point. My second control point has a, the exact same size area of influence. I don't want that in this case. I wanna go ahead and shrink this down and then maybe even just place it somewhere right here and then place another small control point there in the foreground. Um, now that we've removed the effect from the uh, area that we don't want it, let's see if we can get a little bit more space for our image. There we go, that looks a little bit better. Um, I wanna go ahead and cool off the foreground. So the next thing I need to do is actually click the new mask button, and that's gonna give me the ability to add a new control point. So anytime you want a new control point to make adjustments separately from the previous control point, you have to make sure to click that new control point button. Um, okay, so I'm gonna cool this area down a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna make some quick adjustments here. And I might take it a little bit too far in this case, Let's darken it down, add some micro contrast, because I want, I want you to see kind of the speed in which you can operate these things. Uh, obviously, I need to be paying maybe a little bit more attention to the exact adjustments that I'm making. Let's make a duplicate here. And then um, let's make another duplicate over here. And now what we've got is a slightly cooler foreground from our background. From here, let's go ahead and start paying attention to our bride. So let's zoom in a couple times. Uh, I'm gonna use the space bar on my keyboard, which basically gives us a hand tool so we can move around the image. And then I'm gonna add a new mask. And I'm gonna place this new mask right here on Kim 
and I want to warm her up and I want to brighten her just a little bit. Maybe not too much. Obviously, if I take it too far, it's going to look really funky. But I don't mind brightening her uh, or dodging her a little bit more uh, than maybe what I normally would. And that's because I want to be able to see the overall adjustment. And it doesn't hurt the image at all to go in and, you know, really crank the sliders. You do have to be very careful. And I will say with great power comes great responsibility. So, um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't take my Clearview Plus and bring that all the way up to 100. I'm going to give that a second to render. It's probably not going to look particularly good, right? Uh, so you, you do want to be very careful with which sliders you make your adjustments with, um, but it's so fast and it's so easy to see the potential of what could happen with your image, and it doesn't hurt your photo to just go ahead and slide the slider around. Um, you, you might as well. Now, obviously, sometimes we're interested in the speed in which these things can work. Uh, sometimes we're interested in the accuracy in which these things can work. And, and really, the, the more you use them, the faster you'll get with them, obviously. And then also the sort of more potential you'll have um, with adjusting this particular tool. So I'm going to click Close. I'm going to say I'm happy with our selective adjustments because now we're going on 24 minutes. I'm going to click the compare button in the top of our interface. So here's the before, and then here's the after. You're actually seeing an automatic geometry adjustment because of the camera and lens combination that I used. Um, DxO Photo Lab automatically makes those adjustments for us. But we take a look at that before and after. I used like five control points in total, or maybe seven control points in total, and completely transformed the photo. I think I would take this into Color Effects Pro from here and um, make some adjustments now that we've selectively um, adapted and adjusted our photo. Last thing that I want to mention about using control points within um, a Photo Lab 2 is the, the fact that we are using a parametric image editing software and that the adjustments are fully non-destructive because you can always go back. You can always go back to your control points and readjust them however you see fit. So that's really nice. And that's why if, if I'm using my Photo Lab workflow, I will oftentimes not use Viveza too much because almost all of the controls that I have um, within Viveza 2, I have within Photo Lab. And the beauty of Photo Lab is that it's parametric image editing. It's the raw processing tool. So I'm using the raw information. As opposed to as soon as I enter into the NIC plugins, whether I'm using Lightroom as a host piece of software or Photoshop from a host piece of software or Photo Lab, um, once I go into the NIC collection, I'm then operating on generally a TIFF file, um, sometimes can be JPEG, depending upon settings that, that you've set up with your system. Uh, now, let's talk about another kind of control points, and those are the control points that are built into ColorFX Pro 4. Uh, so this will be a relatively quick sort of demonstration using the control points within ColorFX Pro, and that's because the control points in Color Effects Pro are plus and minus control points. So we can either put the effect in or we can take the effect out. Right? So a plus control point is going to put the effect in, a minus control point is going to remove the effect. Uh, now, uh, I think I've got a bunch of questions that are coming in. Yep. The webinar is being recorded and it, it will actually be sent out to you after 24 hours. So when we log out a few minutes after 8, um, the, the video will process and then you'll get a follow-up email and in the follow-up email there'll be a link to uh, the recording of the webinar. Um, all right, so the masks that you're using in, in Color Effects Pro using these control points or within any of the NIC plugins um, and PhotoLab are going to operate in a very similar fashion, but I do want to point out the fact that they are slightly different technologies. Meaning if you use Define 2.0 or Sharpener 3, they have very powerful control points that do specific things for noise reduction in Define or sharpening within Sharpener Pro. But they make a different kind of selection because the algorithms are very different because those are the two of the older pieces of software. Whereas the control points in ColorFX Pro 4 are newer and therefore are different because as as Nick Software continued to develop software, they also continued to develop the control point technology, the U-point technology. And then the control points that you have within uh, Photo Lab are even slightly different compared to the ones you have within Color Effects or HDR Effects Pro 2 and so on. 
Um, so you'll actually notice a slightly different response, even though all you are having to do is place control points on the areas you want the adjustment, make the adjustment, and then take control points where you don't want the adjustment and put them there as sort of um, safety or um, um, control points that will remove an effect. So um, detail extractor. This is a filter within Color Effects Pro 4. It's an exceedingly powerful filter. I, I use this image all the time to demo the software, be, or to demo this um, particular filter, the detail extractor filter, because this is a very common use. And this filter is stunning. It's almost magic by itself. But oftentimes when using these filters, you only want to apply them selectively or in a particular area of the image. To do that in color effects, you use plus and minus control points. So in color effects, the plus control point is going to allow you to put the effect in. Now, currently, the effect is being placed on the entire image. If I click and hold the compare button, you'll see the before and then the after. If I take a plus control point and I place it on the object or the area where I want the effect, what's going to happen is the control point's going to make the selection. We're going to be putting the effect of this filter on the object that we place the point on, but then the adjustment will be removed from everything else. So watch as I place this. In fact, I'm going to take this detail extraction slider way up, probably higher than we'd actually use it. And then I'm going to take a plus control point so that it's a lot more obvious, place it in our water. And then again, what's happening here is that based upon the size of my area of influence, I'm going to be making this very customized selection. And that's where the control points looking at the tone, color, and texture, as well as the edges of all of these objects to kind of figure out where we want the effect and where we don't want the effect. And that's also based upon your input, which is the size of the area of influence. Now, to find the control points uh, here within color effects, you go ahead and open them up by clicking control points. And this opens up into a control points list. And I can go ahead and just click the little uh, X or the little box that's uh, to the right of the first control point. And what you're seeing here is anything that's white has the effect of this detail extractor filter. Anything that's black does not. So this is one of our first, maybe the second major difference between the control points in PhotoLab 2 and the control points here in color effects. The, the visualization of the, of the selection is slightly different. Basically, anything you place the point on, if it turns white, that's what you're going to be affecting. Anything that's black, you're not affecting that area. If I expand this out, you can see I'm affecting uh, more of the area in objects. And then if I take a minus control point and place it into these areas, I can start to really hone in the selection. Um, I, I find myself kind of avoiding this interface using these um, control point sort of viewing or um, the, the mask viewing. Um, and I avoid it because I'm kind of more interested as to the aesthetic and the look of the image. If something weird or funky is going on, then I'll usually open up and, and look at where the adjustment is being made based upon the control points. But I don't find myself using uh, the control point list all that often. It's a really good way to show you how to use these control points. It's a really good way for you to get to know the control points. Um, but once you get used to using them, um, I think you'll find that you don't look at that mask all of that often. I would say maybe in my workflow with these pieces of software, um, one out of five pictures, I might use that, that um, mask because really what I'm just going to do is turn the effect on and off at the filter level, or I'm going to turn the effect on and off by clicking the compare button. And I'm going to say, okay, i am got the effect where I want it. I'm happy. Or if I don't, I'm going to just place points wherever I don't want the effect or where I do. So hopefully that's helpful in explaining control points in color effects. They are plus and minus control points. I'm going to click the save button in the lower right corner. And then I'm just going to go ahead and jump over into the um, go to webinar panel and make sure that we're good to go. Diana, good question. So Diana had a question about the opacity slider that's in um, color effects pro. I'll, I'll show you there are, I'll show you the opacity slider that's on the control points, and then the opacity slider that's also um, built into every single filter in ColorFX Pro. So that's a great question. Um, and so Craig, you said you're scanning around the screen, but you really don't see how to fire up ColorFX. So if you're using PhotoLab 2, um, 
you would you need to have the I think the most up to date version of Photo Lab 2. And to launch into any of the Nick plugins, you use this Nick collection button. I'm sorry if I sort of skipped ahead of that and um, didn't describe what I was doing there. Um, let's just jump into the next photo. Hopefully, there we go. Got another Yosemite shot. I like the color temperature of that one. Although let's change the color temperature of the of the background there, the sky. Um, Cynthia, you said Nick Collection 2 works in Photoshop as filters. Does it work in Lightroom? Yes. Yes, it does. Um, so you can use the Nick Collection um, in, as you can use it from Lightroom as a host piece of software, from Photoshop as a host piece of software, and then from Photolab 2. I'm, I'm doing it here from Photolab because I wanted to describe these control points. Why don't I actually um, make an adjustment with my um, control point? I'm happy overall with this image, but I'm going to go ahead and actually just control the white balance of the sky. I want it to be a little bit more blue. There we go. So I've selectively just white balanced that. Let's see what happens if we place a point on the, there we go, that looks nice. Um, shoot, the name escapes me, that's Half Dome. Okay, so let's say we love this. Um, we could launch clicking the Nick collection, but watch what happens if we click export to application. Um, I'll talk to you about using the plugins from Photoshop as well. So uh, basically right now I'm exporting this image as a TIFF file into Photoshop. I'm gonna click export. Um, that's gonna go ahead and move. It's got, I think it's gotta open my Photoshop as well because I don't know if Photoshop is open. I was gonna actually present completely from um, Photolab too, but the, the beauty of using these plugins from Photoshop um, is, that you have layers, layer masks, and blending modes, among all of the other kinds of controls that you have uh, from Photoshop. So um, what I'm finding myself doing, I, I actually now have a split workflow, which is not ideal. Um, it, and I use Photolab 2 in a lot of cases as my raw processor, and then actually Lightroom as my raw processor, depending upon which cameras I'm shooting with. And then um, I'll oftentimes bring my images from either Lightroom or Photolab into Photoshop and then use the tools in Photoshop that I like to use like layers and layer masks and blending modes and smart objects and all of those great things. So um, from Photoshop to launch the software, you'd use the Nick selected tool or you could go to the filter dropdown menu into um, the Nick collection and you're gonna be able to find that there. So you're gonna find all of the uh, Nick plugins right there within the filter drop-down menu. So I wanted to show you how to launch the software and a few things more within color effects and some details with um, control points. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, feel free to keep the questions coming. I'm, I'm not really able to bounce between the two, uh, but feel free, feel free to type in any questions that you have. And, and at the end of the webinar, we'll, um, we'll jump into those. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of my water and we'll start with the detail extractor filter on this image. Pardon me. All right, so first things first, I can see that Lori, when she shot this, this is a photo by Lori Rubin, um, who's a really amazing photographer and also a uh, compatriot of Nick Software. Uh, she actually was the hiring manager when I got the job there initially, so she shot this photograph. Good buddy of mine, really fantastic photographer. Um, and she had a sensor dust, but it, the detail extractor filter is not helping that. And I could have gotten rid of that in Photoshop or within the photo lab. I just, I didn't see it until just now. Anyways, um, I want the detail extractor filter and I want to place the detail extraction filter just on some of the texture of Half Dome. So again, what I'll do is I'll take the plus control point button and I'm just going to go ahead and drop a control point on Half Dome there. If we take a quick look at the before and after using the checkbox that's to the left of this label, you can see what it's doing. I might be moving too quickly. There's the before, and there's the after. Uh, I'm gonna increase a little bit of contrast. And if we wanna see the selection, again, what you'll do is click on the words control points. Now, you'll notice the opacity slider right now is set at 0%. And that's because we placed this one plus control point on the entire image. And so we're indicating to the software that we only want the effect on half dome. If I delete this control point, you'll actually note that the adjustment is applied to the entire photo 
and this opacity slider is going to go back up to 100%. So I'm going to hit the delete key on my keyboard to get rid of that initial control point. The opacity slider now is back to 100%. Because now what we're doing is we're saying we don't want the plus control point there. We want the effect on the entire photo. But as you add control points, if you add a plus control point first anyways, it's basically indicating to the software that you only want the effect there. Um, and so the opacity overall jumps to zero. If you actually wanted 100% of the opacity on half dome, and then maybe 25% of the opacity on the rest of the image, I could just go back up to the 25% slider, or the opacity to 25%. You can actually do and control opacity on control points as well. So a minus control point has a, a the area of influence slider, and then the opacity slider set to zero by default. But you can, of course, bring that up if you want to. You can adjust that anywhere between zero and 100%. So in the tree up there, I'm gonna leave it at zero, but maybe in the trees down here, I'm gonna place that point and bring the opacity slider up to 20, right? And so basically, these are our three controls, the general opacity of the overall filter, the opacity of the uh, control point, and the minus control point and the plus control point. By the way, the, the basically the difference between a plus control point and the minus control point is just the default opacity. Unless you start with a plus control point on the image, that's that's the caveat there. All right, so um, let's actually add one more filter here. I really love the pro contrast filter, and I think that this image could probably utilize a little bit of that and it looks fine globally so I'm happy with that. I'm actually going to add one more filter which is the foliage filter which is kind of cheating in this case because what this is going to do is find those evergreen trees or they're primarily evergreens I think um, and I'm going to make them more green which is kind of not uh, fair because of this lighting but that's what I want in this case and the foliage filter actually just goes and does that for us. Um, of course we could use control points uh, we could go and make, you know, remove the effect from this tree, but leave the effect in maybe in the background. Plus control point back here in the background, making those more green. And voila. Let's look at the side-by-side -side preview this time. So in this case, we, we used control points pretty extensively. Um, on the left is the original, on the right is the enhanced. And then here's uh, the biggest difference from Photoshop or using the Nick plugins from Photoshop compared to Lightroom or from Photolab, when you click the OK button to apply your adjustment, uh, basically it brings you back into the host software. In Photoshop, we're going to have a second layer applied to the image, and the background layer there is the original photo, and then here is our enhanced image using Color Effects Pro. So that's super helpful, and basically how you use control points from um, from Color Effects Pro. All right, so I'm going to jump back over into Photo Lab. Uh, let me check my notes. Salk Institute Foliage Pro Contrast. Oh, the Lori Bird. Yeah, I wanted to show you this one. Okay, and let's jump over into the Go to Webinar Control Panel. And just make sure there's no problems. Um. All right. So um, no, nobody's having any problems. I see some more questions coming in. I'm going to save them for the Q&A. Uh, so we've got our next image, probably our final photo for the 45-minute presentation, although I've got more as we I want to show you control points within Sharpener Pro as well. Um, I, I want to sculpt the light in this case, right? And um, I'm going to do that using both Photo Lab as well as Color Effects Pro 4. Um, I want to make sure to open an image into Silver Effects as well. So we might actually convert this image into Silver Effects Pro. Into, sorry, convert it into black and white using Silver Effects Pro, um, just for the sake of time. But what I want to do is, again, kind of direct your eye as the viewer. And uh, I think I've covered these control points pretty well, or, or pretty extensively. So maybe I won't go into sculpting the light using these control points so much, and we can do it using some of the filters and color effects um, because I feel like I covered a lot of this here. So let's delete these. And I would probably, this is a, a simple image, right? So we've got this foreground element with the bird and the sticks 
and then, uh, or branches rather, and, and we've got this really beautiful out of focus background, right? So this is a relatively straightforward, simple image to be editing and to be working with, um, as opposed to an image like this one, which is a little bit more complex because now we have two people in it and we've got some distracting elements with the densities and some areas that I wanna sort of um, enhance the natural lighting. So let's see how fast we can do this one. And I still wanna make sure that I'm covering all of the things that I need to cover. So I'm gonna click into the Nick collection in the lower right corner here. We're gonna go into Color Effects Pro 4. Uh, the software is gonna launch and we're gonna start out using the infrared filter. And I'm gonna show you the opacity slider again. I saw like three or four more questions in regards to the opacity sliders. So each, each filter has its own set of controls, and then it also has its own opacity slider. So I think the best way to kind of show this one is using the infrared film filter. This is a highly transformative film it's, or filter. It's trying to emulate um, infrared photographic film. Um, and you can do some interesting stuff for sure. And it, a lot of it's kind of off the wall at its default, but if you get used to using these controls, um, and of course, you know, I've got brightness. I'm, basically, these are the sliders for the filter itself. Uh, but this infrared filter has this really beautiful glowing effect, and I love what it does. And so um, I will oftentimes put this infrared film filter on a color image that I want to be adjusting, and then I click on the words control points, and I just dial the overall opacity down to, you know, maybe 20% overall. Right, so if we look at the before and after, now we've got this kind of soft glow-like lightening of the image. I actually think we're going to bring that down even further. Let's just put like 10% or 7% on this image because the color is such an important facet of this photo. But I love what it's doing. It's kind of opening up. There's a little bit of this glowing effect. And I'm ecstatic now because I have this very subtle effect using this very highly transformative filter. So that's just using the opacity slider of um, of the filter. So I click the add filter button, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and jump into the foliage filter one more time um, and I'll place foliage on this image. And we can change which color that is gonna be applied. And then what you'll notice is that the bird is getting a little bit of this foliage or it looks as though there's a little bit of the adjustment on the bird. And um, I don't want any of the adjustment from foliage on the bird. So I'm going to take a minus control point and place it right there on the bird. And actually, you can see a little shift. So if I delete the control point, take another one, place it on there. Watch the little shift in tone and color. It's subtle, but it's there. And so I don't want it on the bird. So that minus control point removes the effect from the bird. Again, I can click on the words control points. We can go ahead and turn on the selection. And this is basically the... Um, Foliage filter goes and seeks out anything that's green or anything that's made of foliage, yellow green stuff, basically. And uh, it, it enhances the color. If the filter doesn't find that something's green, like the darker portions of the bird, it's not going to affect it. So even though um, the it looks like there's some of this foliage filter being applied back here, I doubt that there's much, if any, color shift because it's it, that's not green. But um, one thing I do want to do is kind of make sure that most of the birds' um, blue foliage, or not foliage, um, the, all the blue, pardon, um, the bird's feathers, um, doesn't have any of the application of the filter. So this is where I'm going to take several minus control points while I'm here in the um, control points list. And I'm just going to go ahead and duplicate a bunch of minus control points. And I did that by holding the option key on my Mac or Alt if I'm on a PC. And while you're holding that option key, you click on the control point and just drag away. So option, click and drag, and you'll get a duplicated control point. So now we've got a bunch of minus control points on uh, the bird's feathers. I also might place a plus control point back here on the background and just go ahead and bring that all the way out, kind of to make sure that the filter is being applied in the areas we do want it to be. And then, of course, I always check by clicking the little checkbox to make sure that we're getting the effect where we want it to be. I think it's too strong, so I'm going to dial this back and make it a lot more subtle. But like for demonstration purposes, I'll oftentimes kind of go a little overboard um, just so that it's easier to see what's going on. So I'm going to add another filter. Let's actually um, 
oh man, I want to show you how to duplicate control points. Let's do that. So uh, I'm going to make or use the pro contrast filter one more time. I'm going to take a plus control point and just place it in the highlight areas of our bird. Um, and then maybe dial the overall control down a little bit in the overall dynamic contrast. So let's say we love that effect. And I want to take these control points and I want to duplicate them to another filter. What you would do is you need to enable all of the control points that you want to utilize. So here I've just basically I activated them. I've turned them on. To do that, you can either do two things. You can click and drag your cursor. So basically it creates this little bounding box. So you click anywhere that's not on a control point and drag. It's going to highlight those control points. Um, or you can hold the shift key down on your keyboard and then click on each control point you want to select. It's the other way of doing it. Um, from there, when they're activated, you move into the active filter. So we're in pro contrast right now. And I'm going to click on the drop down menu that's to the left of the X. You don't want to click the X because that'll delete the filter. Um, you want to click on the little uh, drop down menu here and you say copy control points. Once you've done that, when you add a new filter, um, let's say, like, what adjustment do we want to make here? Uh, how about the sunlight filter? We'll add sunlight overall to the entire image. And then we want to paste the control points that we used pro contrast on. Um, so we'll go to that drop down menu one more time and we'll say paste control points. And now our plus control points that we were using in pro contrast are going to be applied in sunlight. Now, I will just point out that that would be, this is relatively simple. Right, you can just put a couple plus control points on the sunlight uh, filter, but sometimes you're going to be using 10 or 15 or 20 control points, and you want to be able to get those onto the other filters as well. That's where the copying and pasting of control points is is really going to do you some good. Um, and so it's it's 7:50, ladies and gentlemen. I've I've tried to do too many things within our webinar. Hopefully, you found this to be beneficial. I didn't actually get to go into Silver Effects Pro. Um, or Sharpener Pro. If you stick around during the Q&A, I'll open up Sharpener Pro. I just want to sort of demonstrate and talk about the slight differences in those um, um, control points. And, and really, you they operate the same way. It's just where you see the mask is different, and then um, the controls are obviously different because you're sharpening an image as opposed to here where we're either correcting a photograph or stylizing an image. So one quick look at the before and after. Let's do this with a side-by-side -side preview. Let's hide all of this stuff. And then um, you see on the left is the original and on the right is the enhanced. And we made subtle little adjustments, but it's the sum of its parts, right? And those control points basically allow us to uh, create this very subtle set of adjustments that really transforms the image, in my mind, beautifully. Although um, maybe not as um, specifically as, as one would if you weren't talking through the process. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. I'm gonna go ahead and transition into the Q&A portion of our hour here. Um, if you have questions, feel free to type them into the questions box. Um, I'm, I'm gonna try and get through all of them right now. <laughs> and hopefully you found this to be a beneficial demonstration. If you don't already have the Nick plugins, there is a downloadable trial. So you'd go to the Nick software website, you can download it. I wanna say it's either a 15 or 30 day trial. I can't remember now because um, for some reason my brain is not working properly this evening. And um, I've been using the plugins for 10 years. And so I haven't used a trial in, since then. Um, and I've forgotten how many days it lasts for. Maybe somebody knows and can type it into the questions box. But um, I'm going to try and start at the bottom of the questions and knock them out as quickly as possible. So, Rai, you just said you don't see export to application, um, only export to, to disk. That, and, and you're in Photo Lab 2, Rai, if you can answer that one. Um, Niru, can you see a previous webinar? Yeah. Nero, so, um, and sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, but uh, you're, there are a few webinars at the Nix Software website. Oh, I was doing a little research on a designer, which is very amazing. Um, upcoming webinars, that's what I'm looking for. Uh, oh, yep, so, sorry. Learn and support. So if you want to see past webinars, 
Uh, there are a few past webinars that are posted here, and then there are um, hundreds of videos on the Nick Software YouTube channel. So if you go to YouTube and you find the specific Nick Software YouTube channel, uh, you'll you'll be able to watch all sorts of short training videos as well as full length webinars. Um, and you might find those to be helpful. I, I recorded a lot of those several years ago and my friend Brian Matish and so on. Okay, so Rai, you said you are using um, PhotoLab 2, but you don't have export to application, you only have export to disk. So, but in Rai, do you have the Nick collection there? I, I wonder if you're on a different version. I'm not sure. Yep. Huh, you do have the Nick. All the latest, and with the okay, and with Photoshop. I wonder if um, the Photo Lab 2 is just not recognizing that you have other applications. It shouldn't matter because there's all sorts of applications that you can um, you can choose. Whatever application could open a TIFF file, you could have uh, here. Rai, I'm gonna. I'll, I'm sorry, I don't have a good answer for you. Um, I would suggest going to the Nick Software website here, and then go to the support button and um, you get in contact with DxO specifically. Um, okay, oh, there's the software downloads, that's very simple. With FAQs, I think, I wanna say at the bottom, um, there's gotta be a way of contacting. Hmm, I'll figure that one out. All right, I've gotta keep moving with our questions. Uh, so you use the share button and then export to application. How interesting, Rai, I'm not, that one's weird. Uh, John, oh, he says if he's in Windows, there's a drop down next to export to disk where he can choose where to export. Ah, okay, so John, right, share button works for the share application. Okay, so the difference probably is that you're using a Windows machine. In, okay, I get it. Um, when you're in DxO, got it. Cool, I'm glad we've got some DxO experts here as well. Um, Tell us the part of the screen you're moving your mouse is slowed down the mouse movements. Oh, R Robert, I'm sorry. Towards the end of the webinar, I did definitely speed up because I wanted to get through. Um, I wanted to get through more stuff. I'm sorry if I wasn't uh, um, indicating where I was putting my cursor, and it's pretty low contrast in a lot of a lot of times. So I do apologize for that. Thank you for the feedback. Um, cool. People saying it's helpful. That's great. You know, and one thing that I didn't mention, and I that doesn't really pertain to control points, but it, it pertains to, you know, like I'm going to say good guy DxO, if you will, to to use meme culture, um, which is mighty millennial of me, I'm sure. Um, I'm I'm just ecstatic that I have my my Nick plugins and that they're operational and that they are operational for the foreseeable future. Because um, a couple years ago, before DxO bought the Nick collection, I was concerned that it would just stop working. Um, and so the fact that DxO is continuing to update the software, I think is really incredible. Um, especially for the fact that, you know, a lot of my, the aesthetic or a lot of the look that I create in my own work um, comes from the Nick collection. And so if it were to stop working, that would be bad for me. Uh, yeah. So, um, Craig, you said the UI is not intuitive. I'm not sure uh, which piece of software you're talking about or all of them. Maybe you're talking about all of them. Uh, I never got an email with the archived version of the webinar on infrared. How do I get it? Interesting. Jack, um, I wonder if your email was entered improperly. Good question. I'll I'll see if we can download. So I'm I, I disclaimer. I don't actually work for DXO. I don't work for Nick Software anymore. Uh, I'm a, a professor at RIT in the Rochester Institute of Technology, and I teach photography. So some of these questions I don't have good answers to. Um, as far as the webinars, like the infrared webinar that we did last week was recorded, and it should be available, but it's not available on the YouTube page right now. Um, so I'll ask my contact at DxO uh, how those will go um, public. The thing is, is you should get a, an email 24 hours after the webinar that actually um, has a link to the, the video. Um, I see. 
So Lucille, good question. When is DxO going to update Viveza to high def screens? The print is still unacceptably small. So the the newest version of the Nick Collection 2 by DxO, if you're on a PC, has uh, support for high definition screens. If you're on a Mac, you you still got to kind of deal with it, um, which is pretty unfortunate, but because uh, it can be very difficult to see. Um, and I'm not sure. I don't. I don't have good answers on when development things are going to be happening. I I can kind of answer the questions as to how are these things operating in terms of the, what the software is doing. So this is a long question. Pardon me. Uh, it's usually one step photo editor. Ah, uh, okay. So. Um, Martin had a good question. I'm going to try and um, just tell you what the question is and then try and answer quickly. So uh, Martin uses Lightroom as, as a basically a one-stop shop photo editor. Uh, and he uses with the Lightroom catalog as he makes adjustments to the raw files or as a Lightroom user makes adjustments to the raw files. It is written into an XMP file if you turn that setting on. Um, and it's a sidecar file. Photolab does the same thing. It has its own version of an XMP file. So it has a sidecar file. It's not a .xmp. Um, it's sort of legible only by Photolab, but it works that same way. And actually, the if you use Photolab 2, um, you see here in, in our sort of film strip, we've got the original RAW file. It operates the same way as Lightroom in terms of when you go and use the NIC collection, a duplicate file is made. So here we've got our RAW file. We went into Color Effects Pro and adjusted it, and we have a 16-bit per channel TIFF file with the adjustments on it. So it works the same way as um, Lightroom, basically. Um, okay. Sorry, now I need to get back to where uh, I left off with the questions. Uh, can Photolab 2 replace Adobe Lightroom? Oh, Brad, it depends on what you do. If, if what you need is a raw processing piece of software that has really wonderful um, sort of connections between your camera and your lens, because uh, DxO actually creates um, profiles that are specific to the camera body and the lens that you're using um, and automatically applies it, which Lightroom can do as well in the lens corrections, but this is a, it actually works in a slightly different way in the um, Photolab 2 software. B basically, Photolab 2 does almost all of what Lightroom does. One of the major differences is that you're not dealing with a catalog. You have an interface that kind of browses your hard drive. So um, th this is going to, th this is the photo library section, which our webinar didn't discuss at all today. So um, I, I hopefully this is helpful. But basically, this works as like a browser. And so for folks who are less interested in having a catalog, that's one of the main differences with Photolab. Um, I do know that uh, Lightroom is, as they move more into um, a web-based system, will probably not necessarily do away with catalogs because I think there'll be a classic version of Lightroom. By the way, this is purely speculation. Um, the, the Lightroom will be operating in a different way as it's pushed more and more into a, a web-based system. So, you know, another difference in Photolab is that you purchase the software and you do need to purchase updates. So as Photolab 3 comes out, um, or if you want to go from um, sort of like the baseline to the elite version of Photolab, you do have to pay for that, but it's not a monthly subscription base. So that, that's another main difference as well. Uh, is DxO creating a mobile platform? I have no idea. Those are the questions I, I don't know the answers to. Both thankfully as well as kind of in a, I'm disappointed because I like to know that stuff, but uh, it's kind of nice because I um, don't I don't need to know it, and then <laughs> like I can't let in the cat out of the bag, if you will, right? As I would because I'd be very excited and want to tell you guys about all the cool new stuff. So Ray, you said when you're working with a time lapse sequence, can you sync changes from the first image to the remaining images? You can do that with DxO with Photo Lab too. Um, you you still if you're making time lapses and you're shooting raw, you you'd make like general adjustments, but you probably would still want a piece of software for exposure ramping. Obviously, depending upon what you're trying to do. Um, in Photolab 2, while you can 
make adjustments in bulk and synchronize. Um, it's not the same as a piece of software that's dedicated to time lapse. Okay. Neil, yes, Snapseed is the mobile incarnation of Nick. Correct. And Snapseed is actually owned by Google still. Um, that they kept, and actually they integrated a lot of those capabilities and tools into the Android um, operating system, the Photos app, the Photo app on Android. Um, definitely a good call, Neil. And you use LR time lapse. Cool, Ray, great piece of software. And that engineer is really cool. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, I think I skipped over a bunch of questions, but it's because I have like 50 or 60 in here and I was trying to get to the questions as opposed to some of the comments. If you have a question that I didn't answer, if you don't mind just typing into the questions box there, uh, we'll give it another minute or two and uh, I'll gladly answer whatever you've got. But um, I, I missed the question and it'll take me too long to go back. So as you're typing in the questions you might have, I'm going to go ahead and just launch another image into Sharpener Pro to kind of just show you that last uh, little part because the the control points work the same way in Sharpener Pro 3. I'm going to use the output sharpener specifically. Um, just the way that you display the mask is different, basically, and then obviously the controls that you have are slightly different. So uh, this is Sharpener Pro 3.0. It's designed for output sharpening. I'm going to just set it up as if I'm going to make an inkjet print of the image size here, which is 70 um, centimeters by 105 centimeters. Excuse me. I'm going to leave viewing distance on auto. I'm going to choose my paper type. I'm going to say it's on matte paper. I'm going to say I'm using um, an Epson printer that has a 2880 by 1440 uh, printer resolution. And what's cool about this software is the sharpening's done. That, that's all we've got to do is you just have to tell the software how you're going to be outputting the image. And then uh, it basically sharpens for you. As I click on the split preview, on the left is the original, on the right is the enhanced. And where you're going to see the biggest difference is probably like on the moss. It's actually pretty subtle. This is the ideal amount of sharpening. Let's turn it up a bit. Let's say we're going to go to um, display. There you can see a dramatic amount of sharpening before and after. But we've purposely shot this image for a long exposure to get this nice sort of milky water as it comes down uh, the waterfall there. And so we don't want to sharpen that. So what we probably want to do is move to the right side, click on the add control point button, place a point on sort of the average tone and color. So we only have to use a minimal number of control points. It's easy with this image because we just place it on the water, expand the area of influence out. And then I'm going to go ahead and just remove all of the sharpening, the output sharpening from that control point. And so that's going to work in this case, kind of like a minus control point. Um, one of the differences though, is that with sharpener, you have kind of an opacity or the output sharpening strength slider, uh, structure, local contrast, and then also focus. And so um, basically you can kind of go in and control all of those attributes. And now as I double click to zoom in, what you'll notice is that we don't have any of the effect, any of the effect on the water, but we still have the sort of major amount of sharpening uh, going into the rocks and the moss and so on. To display what the um, selection looks like, you actually have to go into the modes section here, drop down menu at the top. And this is this is the sort of older interface option. It's an older piece of software. So if I go to um, effect mask, basically what we're seeing here is anything that is white has the sharpening on it and anything that's black doesn't. And, and so that, that will look recognizable to you. So this minus control point basically has been placed in the water. Depending upon the tone and color that we place it on, we're going to get a slightly different effect. As I duplicate some control points using that option, click and drag, I can really hone in that selection. Sharpened image. All right, so a couple more questions came in. Carl, thank you. I was at Kodak for many years. Oh, that's fantastic, Carl. Very cool. I'm, you know, the great yellow father. I'm a huge fan of Kodak. Uh, still shoot a good amount of film. Cool. Thanks for letting me know. Um, so Ted, when bringing a new image into color effects, it often inherits the control points from a prior image. How do I control this? Wow, Ted, I've actually never heard of that. So Ted, when you open a new image into color effects, the control points from a different photo are on it? I've, I've never heard of that. Carl, cool, man. That's really great. Oh, Ted, that is strange. Ted, um, are you on a Mac or a PC? And do you have a um, a piece of software that could record your screen? Like 
um, shoot, what's I, I use ScreenFlow because I record videos often, but there's QuickTime. If you could actually, re you're on a Mac. Yeah, Ted, if you could on your Mac um, replicate that, if you could record it, you have QTI. Cool, okay. Um, I would like to see that. And then also um, I'm, I'd send that on to uh, my contact. If, if you don't mind, if you can um, you do it. Cause I, I've never even heard of that. And I've been using the software a while. I wonder if it's a system thing. Hey Jerry, Avalanche Gorge, you know it. <laughs> Glad you made it, Terry. Uh, Sharpen Pro is awesome. Oh, I'll send you. Oh, good call. Uh, let's see. Let's questions. Um, sent, Ted. So, Diana, you said if you go from Lightroom to Photo Lab to Lightroom, will you see your changes in library and Lightroom? Probably not, Diana. Diana, if you were to be in Lightroom and you make adjustments in Lightroom in the raw processor in the develop module, and then you were to duplicate that image as a TIFF file over into Photo Lab, you would see whatever you did in Lightroom on that TIFF. But if you were to open the raw file in Photo Lab, you wouldn't see what was done in Lightroom and vice versa. So if you make adjustments in Photo Lab, and then you were to go over into Lightroom, uh, the Lightroom is not going to read the sidecar file that Photolab 2 has created, as far as I know. Absolutely. Yeah, that would, that would be cool. So that, that would be an interesting option for sure if, if all of the pieces of software could kind of talk better to each other. Um, you know, I think the problem is the they're separate companies and they don't want to play that nicely together. I can't say for sure, but I know Adobe, you know, they, it's, they're huge. They're practically the Kodak of the digital age um, in terms of market share and in terms of sort of guiding and driving um, what, how things work in the photo processing realm. Um, yeah. So Eric, you said, uh, when using Sharpener, is there a way to adjust the settings for an outside lab like Costco? Yes. So Eric, you, you'd you want to get some specific background as to what they're doing at Costco, but I would imagine um, if they're making photo prints, their continuous prints is probably from a mini lab. Um, I don't know the exact settings, but I think I can get you close. Um, you would go to, in Output Sharpener, the continuous tone dropdown because this is going to be what you would use for a Lambda or a photographic print um, from a digital image. So you go continuous tone, you can leave viewing distance on auto. And then Eric, it's you, if you can talk to somebody at Costco who runs a lab, if you're able to do this, um, which you might not be able to, or you might not be able to contact them, if they can tell you what photo lab they're using in terms of the actual machine, it's called like a mini lab typically, um, you can figure out exactly what the DPI of that printer is, or if they tell you that you should send your images at 200 DPI or 300 DPI, all you have to do is set this drop-down menu to continuous tone and then tell the software what the printer resolution is. In my experience at this point, I've, I've, I don't have a lot of experience with photo labs, but um, in mini labs specifically, uh, but usually they're either 200 or 400 DPI but that it's completely dependent upon the machine that they're using. But once you set that, then this is the correct amount of sharpening for um, a mini lab that's printing at 200 DPI, which is likely what Costco is doing. Cool, yeah. Just ask them, they might be able to tell you, and then you just set the printer resolution. Diana, you said, so you need to export an image to Lightroom as a TIFF. Yeah, but Diana, I don't, I'm not sure why you'd want, except to have one catalog, I'm not sure why you'd want to make adjustments in Photo Lab and then go over into Lightroom, unless the idea is to house everything in that one catalog. Um, in which case, yes, what you'd have to do is basically make all of your adjustments in Photo Lab and then export that, that raw processed image as a TIFF file and then tell Lightroom where it is, import it into Lightroom. Yeah. Yeah, you need one catalog and it's Lightroom. Fair enough. I, I totally understand that. 
Uh, now, note, and, and here I'm, you know, describing and talking about using workflows with DxOs with PhotoLab too. As a NIC user, you could be sh using all of these capabilities, um, you know, within the NIC collection and not using PhotoLab too. It's just because it's such a powerful tool, I like to talk about that, and because the DxO owns NIC software. And I would imagine, and what I'm hoping for, is that there's more integration of these tools directly into PhotoLab. Um, because the more stuff that I can do in the one piece of software that's applying in a parametric image editing format, um, I'm going to be excited about that. Uh, Al, good question. I'm running Photoshop and the Nick plugins. Will DxO replace your Photoshop? Probably not. Uh, it completely depends upon the kinds of tools and the things that you're doing in Photoshop. Um, it, it, in my mind, all of my photographic adjustments, dodging, burning, contrast adjustments, color adjustments, all of that stuff, I try to do within my raw processing. So within Photo Lab 2 or Adobe Camera Raw, right? Or whatever raw processor that you use. And then I, I try to only use Photoshop when I need layers, layer masks, blending modes, or whenever I need to move pixels around, if I'm doing a composite um, or, or anything like that or a layout even, depending upon what that layout is. So Al, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't advise on if Photoshop would be, would be replaced by PhotoLab. Uh, but for most photographers, you could probably get away with just using PhotoLab too, for the most part. Uh, Ray, you said Costco prefers JPEG, but TIFF uh, DPI dependent. 150 for metal prints, higher for canvas. Well, that answers that. So Ray, you, what what I would recommend is when you sharpen in in the Nick collection, if you can, and this is an added step, but it's it's purely for quality purposes. Um, size the image to how big or small you're going to print the photograph. Bring it into uh, Sharpener Pro 3 as a TIFF file, 16-bit TIFF file. Sharpen it, and then when you export the file out of your software to to basically then send it on to um, send it on to Costco, save it as a JPEG to send it then. Um, and the reason you want to do that rather than taking a JPEG into any of the plugins with the NIC collection um, is that you're typically going to get better results from a 16-bit per channel TIFF file. They're much bigger, they're massive files, but um, they're, they're going to yield you better quality results, especially with something like sharpening, because if a, if a JPEG comes into the software, it will definitely work but because um, there is what's called JPEG compression, um, you can oftentimes have uh, artifacts occurring, especially when sharpening. So yeah, I guess take that with a grain of salt too. Diana, you said, can I take a smart object into PhotoLab? Well, that's a good question. I've never tried to do that. I, I don't know, Diana. I'm gonna say no, but definitely try it. I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Um, Eric, I know, uh, I know you since Nick was introduced, I've always, oh, very cool. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate that. Brad, you've been using Affinity Pro or Affinity Photo to replace Photoshop. Brad, that's cool and great, great insight. I'm going to see if I can get Affinity Pro on this laptop and try it out because you're not the first person who's told me they were able to basically replace Photoshop with Affinity Photo. Thank you. Oh, yes, Diana, the Nick plugins will work with smart objects for sure. Oh, cool, Fred, you're a St. John Fisher. God, oh, great. Fantastic. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, no worries, Diana. Uh, okay, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for joining me uh, and joining us at the webinar uh, this evening. Hopefully you've had a good time and I've answered your questions and you've learned a little bit more about how control points are working. I think I kind of went off the rails talking more about the functionality of control points than actually sculpting the light. But once you get used to utilizing this control, um, kind of the sky's the limit. You can, you can photographically make beautiful selections and so on. So it's very easy to use once you get used to it. Uh, thanks again, ladies and gentlemen. Have a really fantastic evening, and hopefully I see you again soon at another one of our webinars. There's another one on Thursday, and make sure you check out um, the, the upcoming webinars page on the Nick software website. Thanks again. Bye-bye.